Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. And we definitely have an inspirational story today as I am joined by entrepreneur Courtney Lewis. Courtney has went through a lot of trauma in her life. She has studied criminal justice and massage therapy. And I know that doesn't make sense, but it will once you hear a story. She's went through things like having her dad in prison and even having a law enforcement duty weapon pointing pointed at her head at a young age. So we're going to be talking all about that and everything that Courtney's up to. So Courtney, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. And and thank you to your audience for, for having me. I appreciate it. Well, why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Well, I am 32 years young, grew up, born and raised in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Minnesota area. And it was it was hectic. It was lots of highs, lots of lows, as as you mentioned. I was I was born in, in Wisconsin and we were in a, a rough part. And a lot of people don't think rough when they think Wisconsin, but it was my next door neighbor for the most part was a pimp. And that was my babysitter. <laughs> and my mom wanted to move me across the river, literally about 10 minutes across the river to Minnesota to give me a better chance away from the drugs and the racial inequality, just to, to kind of have a fighting chance in life. And that's when life kind of took a turn. That's when everything all went downhill for the both of us, for our entire family. And uh, that's kind of where my story starts. Well, when you say downhill, as much detail as you want to go into, explain to the listeners what happened once you guys moved. Well, my father has been in and out of prison. He's a he's a Cuban immigrant, came over during the Maria boat lift. And he, he's been in and out of incarceration, in incarceration since he was in Cuba. Um, and he came over, he was like, I want to say 16 when he came from Cuba. Uh, and over here was no different. He actually met my mom when he was fresh out of prison in 89. And, uh, so he was, he was in and out of my life for incarcerations. When we moved to Minnesota, when normal kids were going on, family picnics and excuse me, family, um, you know, trips, vacations, things like that. My family was actually running drills on how to conceal my father. Should the police ever come looking for him? We, you know, most families were watching America's funniest home videos in the nineties, having movie nights, things like that, or game nights. My family was watching America's most wanted to make sure my father wasn't on a, on an episode. And I never understood that. As far as I knew, my dad, you know, the worst thing he would do was get drunk and steal frozen pizzas from the local gas station, which obviously that's not right either. But um, that's as far as I knew his criminal history was. There was no Internet back in those days there. This was before Google. This was the early 90s. Um, and then I remember in 1996. Um, my mom, it was middle of winter. We had just celebrated my dad's birthday and I was taking a bath and all of a sudden I hear boom and my mind, I was six years old and my mind instantly said, the police are here and no child should ever have that, that mindset to just know the police are here when you hear that kind of pound on your door. And I just hear tons of stomping through our house. We had a little one bedroom apartment and um, I hear them screaming, Armando, where are you? Where are you? We know you're here. Come out, come out. And then I hear them pounding on the bathroom door. We know he's in there. We know he's in there. Come out, Courtney, come outside. And I just kept screaming. He's not in here. I'm taking a bath. And my mom was just crying. She said, she's taking a bath. She's naked. Let me at least get her clothes. They said, nope, you don't have time to get her clothes. Get her out of the bathroom. So my mom brought me a towel and uh, they would not allow her to get me clothes. 
as soon as I came out, they had a gun to my head. And again, I'm only six years old, so I'm traumatized at the fact that I have a gun to my head. And she was babysitting this little boy. He was maybe six, seven months old at the time. He's screaming. And they told us to go stand out on our porch, which was not fully enclosed. It was exposed to the elements. And they wouldn't allow any of us to get winter jackets on, wouldn't allow us to put any warm clothes on, wouldn't allow me to put any clothes on. So I'm standing there dripping wet in a towel. Uh, and all I could think was, don't look in the living room closet. Don't look in the living room closet. And, um, we had, like I said, we had practiced the drill over and over how to conceal him, but somehow he made a noise or something. And they said, Armando, we know you're in the closet. Come out, come out with your hands up. And I watched them hog tie my father and carry him down the stairs in the dead of winter with no shirt on, no shoes on, no socks, just sweatpants, and throw him at gunpoint in the back of a squad car while I and my mother and a seven-month-old baby were all held at gunpoint. That was my first experience. That was my welcome to Minnesota. Um, On top of that, every child that grew up in that It was, I lived in an apartment. It was, it was like a triplex apartment, but it was in a, in the middle of a trailer court, a very prominent trailer court in that town. Every child that lived in that trailer court left sexually abused. Every single one of us. Uh, It was not, it was not good to us, to any of us. Uh, My mother and I, And one of our neighbors were in a car accident shortly, maybe seven or eight months after my father was arrested. That left my mother permanently disabled. To this day, she still suffers tremendously because of that car accident. A a military woman was speeding and driving half asleep. And her excuse for hitting us was, I was watching a cute guy go by in his truck. And uh, that led to my mom's severe depression. She couldn't get out of bed. She couldn't take care of me. And again, I was, I had, boy, I must have just turned seven. I must have just, yeah, I must have just turned seven. And, um, anytime I tried to take care of myself or take care of the house, clean, do dishes, anything, my mother would scream at me. I'm talking the way that you wouldn't even scream at a grown adult. And our house ended up disgusting. We had pets that went unkempt. We had like, our house was filthy, turned into episode of hoarding buried alive, um, Eventually, we got evicted from that house. My grandparents bought a trailer and let my mom make payments on it towards paint, like rent to own. And that home became a hoarding situation as well, to the point we had, I think, nine cats at one time. We had fish. We had all sorts of animals. And there were fleas everywhere, roaches. Our cats would vomit and there would be worms in it. They would urinate and defecate everywhere. And again, my mom wouldn't let me clean anything. So it just rotted through our floors. Uh, Anytime I would leave the house, I would have to leave 45 minutes before I had to be at the bus stop or to wherever I needed to be just to get the bugs off of me. I remember going outside in the summertime and looking down at my legs and you couldn't even see the color of my skin because there were so many fleas on my skin. It was, it was bad and nobody was the wiser or nobody cared to say or do anything until I was in second grade. I was called to the principal's office and I was met by the chief of police, the school nurse, the school counselor, and the principal. And they interrogated me eight years old and I broke down, told them everything. And when I got home on the school bus, I just hear everybody laughing and saying, oh, she's going to jail. And I looked and it was my mom just sobbing with the chief of police behind her. And the first thing that came to my mind was, I'm going to foster care. I had no idea what that meant. I have never been in foster care to that point, but I just knew I was going to foster care. 
And I got off the bus and I ran up to my mom and he said, you have five minutes to say your goodbyes and you are going to your grandparents' house and you will not see your mom again. And that was the hardest thing. Like I resented my mom for the way that we had been living, but that was the hardest thing that I had been through up to that point, even after having a gun to my head or being babysat by a pimp and watching him beat his pregnant wife while she was in labor and telling her to shut the F up. And like, I had been through a lot up to that point. And that was probably the hardest thing was being taken away from my mom and placed with my grandparents, my very racially ignorant Caucasian grandparents. That was very difficult. Um, And then living with their daughter, my aunt, who was always threatening my life at every chance she could. That was, that was pretty miserable. So that was, that was my introduction to Minnesota. (laughs) Well, you've, you've really been through a lot. Tell us how you got into criminal justice and massage therapy. Criminal justice was my way of making a change from the inside of the system out. I ended up Obviously, you know, my dad was in and out of incarceration. I ended up having a run in with the law when I was 16. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD and OCD and PMDD, which is I for all of our guests who are unaware. And I apologize for the TMI in advance. Um, it's like PMS, but on steroids, everything is magnified. So when I go through it, I rage. And uh, I was having suicidal tendencies and ideations. And when I was 16, I was going through it so hard. And I was having complications because I was inconsistent with my ADHD and depression meds. They had me on extremely high doses of Adderall and Prozac. And I wasn't I was abusing them, but not in the way that people think of abusing them. I was just very inconsistent with them. And I ended up going to juvenile federal detention because my neighbors said that I was threatening them with a knife when in reality I was outside being suicidal with a knife. Luckily, my charges were reduced and I was let go and everything got squared away. I got probation, all of that. But it took a guard in juvenile federal detention to tell me, you're not a bad kid. You're not a bad person. You are not your mistakes. You just made bad decisions. And um, that really, that really stuck with me over the years. And it took a jailer when I went to court to tell me, you know, a lot of kids go through the system and they get stuck in the system because when they make mistakes, their parents don't want to give them another chance. So if you need a place to stay, you're always welcome to come stay at my home. And this was this little old man. And he was just like, my wife and I are more than willing to to take you in and help you out because you're not a bad kid. And I wanted to be that change for a kid. I wanted to be somebody that, you know, let these kids know you're not bad kids. You're not your mistakes. You just made bad decisions and it's okay we all make mistakes. And so I just really wanted to make a decision, make a, make a change from the inside out within the system. So that's how I got into criminal justice. But I always had a passion for massage therapy as alternative medicine. And so I was so torn as to which way I wanted to go with my degree. And then shortly before or after high school graduation, my grandmother that I was placed with during foster care, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis as well as her sister. And uh, she was given these ridiculous drugs that were so costly and had the worst side effects. And she said they help, but not to the extent that I would like them to. And not they're, they're just not worth the price that I'm paying. Um, And every time I go get a massage, it helps tremendously, but I can't afford to go, you know, every day. I can't afford to go do it as often as I would need it to, or as I would need to. And all I could think was, this is alternative medicine. This isn't a luxury. And 
I feel like this needs to be offered to more and more people that could use it, could, you know, need it. And so that was another place where I felt I need to help make a change. I need to help make a difference. So after I, you know, started criminal justice, I actually took a break and went to school for massage therapy. And there were actually a lot of people there who were going to school to use it as alternative medicine, like for cancer patients, for you know, people who are at end of life and things like that. So I was like, wow, I really am in the right place. And then once I finished up with that, I went back and finished my criminal justice degree. Well, you also were building your brand. You were battling chronic illness and and doing weight loss surgery. Yes. So tell us about that. In 2016, I had the worst pain of my entire life. I literally thought I ruptured my bladder and I was bedridden for two weeks. I didn't go to the doctor. I didn't, I was so scared that they were going to tell me, well, you ruptured your bladder. There's nothing we can do. You're, you're dying. But then eventually went away and it came back. Finally, I decided to go in. And they said, you have diverticulitis. And that they said, there's nothing we can do but operate, take out part of your colon. And right now you are not at a healthy enough weight where we can safely operate. If we operate right now, you will die. And that's when I realized I was, my. I knew my weight was out of control. My highest weight, I was 627 pounds. I knew I was, I knew my weight was out of control, but when they told me that they couldn't even, what was going on with me could kill me, but to save my life could kill me, I knew something was ridiculously wrong. So I tried to go back for the weight loss surgery, which I had attempted three other times before this and failed miserably. I did not have the determination to lose the weight I needed before surgery. And this time I was like, I'm 300 pounds more than I was before. There's no way I'm going to be able to get this surgery this time. And um, the diverticulitis just got worse and worse and worse. I was literally in the hospital weekly for four to five days at a time. And then I would get out, go home for maybe two days, and then I would go right back to ER and they'd admit me again. It got to the point where the registration nurses at the emergency room, before I could even get into the door, they'd have my name pulled up. They'd be like, hey, Courtney, just come on back. We've got we've got a room for you. And um, this was, like I said, 2016. And then fast forward I'm going through the weight loss surgery process to try to drop weight for surgery so I can lose enough weight after surgery to even get the colon surgery that I need to save my life. Then COVID hit in 2020 and uh, the the nationwide shutdown happened and everybody was just struggling without human interaction. It was miserable. And I wanted to create a safe space where people could come together and just coexist without the drama, without the stress, without the talk of this disgusting virus that's out there, just without politics, without all the BS. And so I built a women's empowerment group on Facebook and I expected it to be maybe a couple hundred people locally and maybe stick around for a couple of months and Fast forward two years and we're 8.3 thousand women worldwide. And it's it's crazy to me. I never expected it to even be a brand. And that, let's see, that was, we started in September of 2020. In May of 2000, let's see. Yeah, that was in September of 2020. In May of 2020, I had my weight loss surgery. I was, I dropped from 627 to 467. And then uh, September or no, August of, of 2021, I had my, no, I'm sorry. I'm getting all my dates wrong. August of 2020, I had weight loss surgery. May of 2021, I had my colon surgery. 
So I ended up, obviously I'm still here. I had my life-saving operations, had my weight loss surgery. But the thing is, in between those two surgeries, I had over a dozen minor surgeries. I kept getting infections from my bladder and everything. Uh, I ended up having to have my appendix removed during my colon surgery. The diverticulitis wrapped its way around my appendix. Um, They couldn't figure out why I kept coming in with inflammation there. And that ended up happening. They didn't think I would make it through that surgery. It was such a long process. They said I would either have a heart attack or stroke out because I was under so long. For six months after my weight loss surgery, I lost all use of the lower half of my body due to a vitamin B deficiency. And they they don't test for that vitamin deficiency. So they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, why I had no use of the lower half of my body. I ended up with pulmonary embolisms. I had COVID all within a couple of weeks. I lost most of my hair. It was, it was nuts. It was nuts. All of this while building this women's empowerment group and brand. (laughs) Uh, On Lady Like Lounge. The On Lady Like Lounge. Yes. Yes. So, so what kind of, of help have you gotten like professional help for all of the things that you've been through, if any? I have been on and off in therapy. Um, part of the bariatric surgery program is going through therapy. And then as far as the bariatric program itself, I'm actually due to have another weight loss surgery in December because part of that vitamin B deficiency caused me to have a hiatal hernia. So my stomach is actually lodged through my diaphragm and behind my heart and lungs. So that's part of the professional help that I've gotten. Uh, And I'm actually super thankful for that, that hernia because it's kept me in the program, which has forced me to stay with therapists and psychiatrists and stay on top of my mental health because you don't really realize how long that trauma lingers with you and the effects that it has on you years later is it's like as soon as you think that you've dealt with something and you think you're past it boom it'll hit out of nowhere like a ton of bricks and it's it's difficult and um, when you think that you've forgiven someone for something that they've put you through or something that they've done that has affected you deeply you know it hurts all over again i've taken a lot of um a lot of courses on psychology and trying to figure out like why certain people move, I guess, the way that they move or do the things that they do act the way that they act, just to try to understand, you know, other people, their actions and and their, their perspectives a little better. Uh, just, just to try to get an understanding and, and step outside of my box, see things from another angle. But therapy has definitely been my number one. And it's not for everybody or for every every time you have to be ready for it. You can't force it. But that has definitely been my go-to. Well, what, what advice would you give people who might be kind of hesitant to seek help for, you know, things like trauma, substance abuse, anything like that? Want it for yourself. If you're not ready, whether it's trauma, substance abuse, anything like that, wherever you are in your journey, reach out and let somebody know that you're struggling. It doesn't have to be a professional. It can be a trusted friend, a trusted family member. Just let somebody know that you're struggling so that you're not in it alone. Uh, Just to make sure that you're safe that you have somebody checking in on you and externalize that stuff. Make sure that you're getting it off of your mind, off of your chest. Uh, Whether you like to write, whether you like to scream along with music at the top of your lungs, whether you like to work out, kickboxing is a great, is a great activity, getting physical and just working out those inner demons, all of that stuff, but make sure you're externalizing it. Make sure somebody knows that you're struggling. So that way you have somebody who's in it with you. It's just, just have a safety net, have some, something and somebody there for you. And 
I'm here. I, you can link my socials. You can link the group. You can link our website, whatever, but I am here. I care. Well, do you have any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about? Right now, I am working on getting uh, a fundraiser up and running. Well, it's it's currently up and running, but I am working on spreading it around a lot more. We are looking to sponsor families in need, not just for the holidays, because not everybody celebrates holidays, but for the winter season. They can be brutal with whether it's meals, gifts, bills, essentials, anything people need for the winter uh, the winter seasons. We are looking to sponsor families, just people in need in general. Uh, that is our big thing that we're doing right now. So if people are looking for some kind of assistance and would like to uh, sign up to be sponsored, come holler at me at the Unladylike Lounge. Uh, if people want to know where they can donate, that can be done right on our website, theunladylikelounge.com. We are always looking to to support anybody that we can. We do not keep any of the proceeds whatsoever. That all goes back to people in need. All right. So, so ladies and gentlemen, y- y'all be sure to check her out. Speaking of your brand and your business, what advice would you give somebody trying to start a business, a podcast, a brand, or anything like that? Start where you're at and just just go. You don't learn to drive a car while it's parked. You just have to start where you're at and go. To be completely honest, I had no idea what a podcast was until I was like six episodes deep. And then I was like, so what we're doing is podcasts. Like, this is a podcast. Oh, okay. I had never listened to a podcast before in my life. And then I was like, Oh, okay. I think I get it now. And uh, like, like I said, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just winging it. And you just have to have faith in yourself. Faith in yourself is going to take you so much further than, than absolutely anything. And network is not always what you know, it's who you know. Reach out to people. There's so much room at the winner's ta- at the winner's circle. Like, reach out. If you have questions, I'll answer questions. I'll help you out. I'll let you know what I know. Like anybody that's going to be secretive with information about how to build a brand, how to build a business, how to make podcasts and stuff like that. They're, they're not the kind of people you want in your inner circle anyways. Like that's just petty. Find the people who are willing to reach back and help you up. Well, close us out with some final thoughts, maybe something that I failed to touch on that you would like to talk about or just any final thoughts that you have. Words of wisdom out of your vulnerabilities will come your strength. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable. And throw out that website one more time. The unladylike lounge.com. Don't judge us by our shop. We do we do good stuff for people. Don't judge us by our shop. <laughs> the unlady lounge.com. The unladylike lounge.com. The unladylike lounge.com. Yes. Get it right. <laughs> right. Well, Courtney, I, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us this evening. Your story is just Amazing, heartbreaking, but it's definitely inspirational and motivational. Listeners, please be sure to follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. And as always, if you enjoy this episode or you enjoy the show, please be sure to tell a friend. Courtney, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. You have a wonderful night, everybody. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.